guys, you kind of get the rough end of the stick today. Uh, but that's just how, how, how it worked out. All right, Malachi chapter 4, Luke chapter number 1. If you'd like to stand, we'll read together. Appreciate you being here. It's really a blessing for you coming to church, uh, especially in these crazy times, and uh, I'm glad to be able to have you. Those that are visiting, we're glad to have you all. This is obviously not our normal way that we do things. Normally, we're pretty much packed out, every pew, but we're having to separate and do all these things, make people... A little bit comfortable and not uh, force everybody to be touching everybody. So we'll see how things go for a while like this. And hopefully we can one day get back to normal. But if not, we'll just move forward. All right, Malachi chapter number 4 and then Luke chapter number 1. Malachi chapter number 4, last book in the Old Testament and the last chapter of the Old Testament. We'll just read the whole part. Verse number 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now I want you to notice that last verse and turn over to Luke chapter number 1. Luke chapter number 1. Now this is the passage where the parents of John the Baptist have been chosen and of course Zacharias, John the Baptist's father, uh, goes into the temple and sees this angel and so forth and you'll notice that when the angel talks to him Look in verse number 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from its mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You'll notice verse 17 is a quotation from Malachi chapter number 4. And so I want to preach some on that idea and that theme of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Let's have a word of prayer. Brother Chris Watts, we ask the Lord to bless the message for us. Lord, we come to you this morning and uh, like to talk to you this morning. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for allowing us to be able to have church. And, uh, Lord, most importantly now, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will move through here and just take over and that you'll use preacher in a mighty way and you'll just, you'll just move through here and, and help us, Lord, to, uh, to hear exactly what it is you have for us this morning. I just plead the blood and pray that you'll just wash this place down, that there'll be nothing between us and you, Lord, us and your word, that, that we may be able to hear clearly, and that your word would affect your work on our hearts, that we might be able to draw closer to you, that we might be able to be pleasing unto you, Lord. We owe you everything, Lord, and Amen. by your grace, I just pray that you'll help us be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. And you'll notice here as we look at these two passages, it's, I've read it I don't know how many times, but I've never really given it a whole lot of thought except for the fact that, you know, there's a prophecy here about Elijah coming and we know that John the Baptist fulfills that ministry and that role of Elijah because the first and second coming of Christ, they're seen in the Old Testament as one. And there's not really a division between the first and second advent of Christ. So you have John the Baptist in that role of Elijah if the nation of Israel would have received the Messiah 
And then things would have taken place as far as Bible prophecy goes, just like the Old Testament laid it out. However, they did not receive their Messiah. They had him crucified. And we know that now we're still waiting for those other events of the second coming to come to pass as prophesied. So John goes in the power and spirit of Elijah. He's not Elijah, yet he is in that role as the prophet that prepares the way of the Lord. It's interesting, when you read Malachi chapter 4, the last book in the Old Testament, the last word in the Old Testament is curse. That's pretty strong. As a matter of fact, that's so strong that a lot of the Jews, when they read those passages like here in Malachi and in Lamentations, they switch the verses around because, quite frankly, they don't want to face that because without a repenting and turning to God, there is a curse. And so really when you think about John's ministry, he's preparing the people for the Lord. And if the people don't get prepared, really it's real simple. If you don't get prepared for the Lord, there's a curse waiting for you. If someone doesn't receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, there's a place called hell waiting for them. That's a curse. You know, the condemnation and the curse is not something God's waiting to give. That's something that's already out there. In other words, he that believeth not, the Bible says, is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Ever since Adam sinned and passed that curse down to us, we're under that curse. And until someone turns to Jesus Christ, the curse can't be lifted. Now think about this in terms of the nation of Israel. Here they are, 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew, 400 years before the Messiah comes, and here comes the herald John the Baptist preaching, and the message and the idea is to get everybody ready for Jesus, to get this people ready to meet the Messiah. How does he start? He starts with fathers and children. In other words, if he's going to deal with a nation, well, who's he going to deal with? He's going to deal with fathers and their children. That has to do with families. This world is made up of people. I am a people and you are a people. You say, well, I'm not a people person. Well, you are a people people, so you ought to be a people person. <laughs> I sometimes don't want to be around people. I want to be quarantined, right? And then you get quarantined, you're like, man, I'm ready to be around some people. I've got to get out of this. Uh, but when you think about civilizations, when you think about nations, when you think about the global empires that are there, when you think about cities and towns and communities, you think about people and you think about the masses. Sometimes you can think about people corporately, and that's true. God looks in the Bible and he picks out Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He bypasses Ishmael, by the way. The Arabs are out. And he gives a piece of ground, the, only, the first time the word holy appears in your Bible, it refers to the nation of Israel. And he picks out that people and he gives them a literal piece of ground. And he deals with the nations through that people. Jesus Christ is of the seed of Abraham. So you can think about nations corporately as God often does. What does it say in Psalm 917? The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. What does God think when he sees America? When they vote in rights, now transgenders and sodomites have civil rights. You have a small business and you refuse to hire somebody because of their perversion, you can be sued. That's the good old U.S. of A. What does God think about this group? So you can think of things corporately, but then when you begin to break down nations, you break them down with families. And as the families go, so go the nations. One reason we have such a bad nation is we have such broken families. And when you break the family down, you say, we have all these maverick moms and delinquent dads. Yeah, I know we do, but when we break that down, what we want to look at today, especially because of the day, is the fathers, because the fathers are to be the leaders of the home. So he starts off with fathers and children. So if he's going to deal with the family, he's going to deal with the fathers. And I've said this before, I'm glad we have some good men in our church, and I'm glad we have some good fathers in our church. That's a blessing to have some men that will read the Bible with their kids, some men that will teach Sunday school. We have Sunday school, and of course we haven't been able to have it, 
But we have men Sunday school teachers, and their wives are in there. We have, of course, my wife teaches the little kids. But that's a blessing to have some men that are Sunday. Look, I'm not downplaying the ladies. I know you go to a lot of churches, and every, the ladies are on all the committees, and the ladies are having to do anything because the men aren't doing anything. They're just out hunting and fishing and they don't want to go listen to some sissified preacher or whatever. I understand that's how a lot of churches are. But it's a blessing to have some godly men that will say, Hey, I'm still a man, but I'm also a Christian. I'm still a man, but I believe the Bible. I believe in righteousness and I believe in godliness. You, can be, you don't have to check out your manhood to be a Christian. I get so sick and tired of this kind of, you know, well, we're just going to tolerate everybody and God loves everybody. And what kind of theology are you talking about? When you study Jesus Christ, he was a man's man. He got so mad, he took a whip and he drove him out of the temple. That's not some kind of Joel Osteen, every day's a Friday type of preacher. <laughs> this is a real man that says, you're making my father's house a den of thieves. Get out of here. And so the appeal in the Bible is to the men and to the fathers. And so that's where John starts off here, and that's where I want us to look at as we think about this, because you have really two admonitions here. And that's really what we're going to do, and we'll, we'll be done. Uh, we have an admonition to the fathers and then to the children's. We have an admonition to the fathers regarding their reckless, recklessness, and then to the children re regarding their rebelliousness. Turn the fathers to the children. What does that imply? To me, the more I begin to think about this, I think, okay, that means maybe they haven't been given attention to their children like they should. Why would a father have to turn his attention toward his children unless he had not been giving attention to his children? Maybe he's been reckless to his kids. So that is a rebuke. And then the children to the fathers, and then when we read back in Luke, instead of saying children to the fathers in Luke's account, he says the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. So he puts that word disobedient in the place of children because it's the natural tendency for a kid to rebel. It's kind of tough being a kid. And you young people in here, I sympathize with you. You kids... It's bad being told what to do all the time. I mean, you're told when to get up, when to go to bed, what to eat, when to eat. Everything, you're just always being told what to do. That's tough. And sometimes the tendency, especially when you start getting a little freedom, and especially start when your great wisdom in your mind begins to figure out how you can manipulate mom and dad, you want to do what you want to do. Because that heart, the Bible says, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So the tendency is to rebel and do what we want to do. And may I say this, rebel against authorities. We'll get into that in just a little second. But oftentimes there's a breakdown in the home because everybody's heart is in the wrong place. When John is going to turn an entire nation toward the Messiah, he's going to have to get to the heart. That's why it says the hearts of the fathers. The idea is we don't need more religion. I feel sorry for these religious places where they put so much emphasis on the sacraments where you've got to sip the cup and eat the bread and do all the stuff and everything's about everybody drinks out of the same cup. What are you going to do now? Nobody wants to get the cooties, so how do you get your religion? We don't need more religion. We need a relationship and it begins with the heart. And so he says, the hearts of the fathers to the children. Let's look at two main passages, Ephesians chapter 6 and then Colossians. We'll talk to the children first. Ephesians chapter 6 and then Colossians chapter number 3. These are two fundamental passages in Paul's epistles for us to understand some things about family life. And really, you know... It's amazing. A lot of these people, they'll go out and they'll spend all this money on dog training videos. And, I mean, you can get all kind of stuff now. And you can get all this stuff to, where, you, where you learn about the type of dog you have and the breed of dog. And, and they do have different characteristics. Certain dogs, we used to have for years, we had a poodle. You talk about a high-strung dog. That dog had separation anxiety big time. It would literally make itself sick if we were gone for a long time. It knew when I would come home, it knew to go to the door and wait for me at that particular time every day when I would come home. And it would just drive itself crazy like that. 
And so we, after it had passed on and we got another dog, we didn't get another poodle. Now, nothing against poodles. You got a little poodle, that's fine. But I didn't want another dog, you know, that's just flipping out all the time. So our dog, she pretty much chills out. And she, um, you know, she gets excited and stuff. But after a while, she'll just flop down and lay there and take it easy. And that's good. I like that. There's not, not as much stress. I don't need a lot of stress. But it's amazing how people will get some animal or something and they will uh, they'll do all this training, read all these books, do all this stuff. But then when they have children... They just think that it comes naturally or it comes by osmosis or something. God has given us some amazing wisdom throughout the whole Bible, but especially here in Paul's epistles about fathers and children and families and husbands and wives and all those details to help us. I mean, he's the one who made us, so he, he wrote the owner's manual. So let's look at it for just a second here. Look in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 1, children. Obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. You say, why won't you live long on the earth? Well, there your mom or daddy says, I brought you into this world, I can take you out of this world. <laughs> you find out real quick if you're going to live long or not, based on how you act, okay? Um, verse number 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now look over, if you will, in Colossians chapter 3, verse number 20. In both of these passages, if you back up to Ephesians 5 and you back up a few verses here in Colossians, it deals with the husbands and wives. But look in verse number 20 of Colossians 3. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. All right, so we have these great admonitions here. So let's talk about the children for just a second. We have biblical counsel to the sons and daughters. He said to, I'm just going to give you these three things, and uh, we can kind of see how they come out of both of these passages. Number one, respect, don't rebel. Easy way to remember it. Children to the fathers, respect, don't rebel. Uh, to have respect... Down here in the South, you know, we have a pretty good tendency to teach our children and young people to say yes, sir, and no, sir. And yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. Now, up north, in some areas, when a lady is said to be a ma'am, that offends them because they think, oh, you're saying that I'm old or whatever. So sometimes, you know, you have to realize the culture and the area which, where you are and how you say certain things. But the idea behind that, at least down here, was to show respect Instead of just saying, yeah, or, huh, hey, son, come over here, huh, don't you huh me. <laughs> respect. How do you talk to someone? How do you hold yourself to someone? So the idea is to respect, not to rebel. And let me say this, and I mentioned it a minute ago, about rebelling against authority. God has placed authority in all of our lives. And that is one of the fundamental problems with all of us. And you can trace it all the way back to the, not only the fall of man, but to the re rebellion of Satan. When he rebelled, Isaiah chapter 14, he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He rebelled against God's authority. And ever since, we've had this cosmic battle between God and the devil. And the idea is basically is, who's the king of the hill? Who's in charge? The devil wants to be in charge. He's trying to take things over. And God says, I'm in charge. You break that thing down in the family. The Bible says God made Adam, then he made Eve. And by the way, he didn't make Adam and Steve. Amen, amen and amen. amen. So I don't know what I am. We'll check the plumbing and find out. Amen. amen. It's a crazy, messed up world that you've even got to talk about this stuff. He made Adam and Eve, and he made Adam before Eve. You say, well, the reason that there's some type of authority with the husband over the wife is because of, you know, they sinned and all that kind of stuff. That's not what the New Testament teaches. The Bible says that the women are supposed to be in subjection to their husband because Adam was first formed, then Eve. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. And it's not a thing saying a man is better than a woman. A man is not better than a woman. A man is just different than a woman. That's another thing you have to point out. Men and women are different. Let's celebrate diversity. What do you mean by that? I'll tell you what they mean by that. They mean that we're going to try to make things that aren't the same the same. 
You really want to celebrate it? You point out the differences. A man is not a woman. He's not supposed to be. And a woman's not a man. She's not supposed to be. Typically, and I know there are exceptions, but exceptions prove the rule. Typically, a little girl won't want to get down in the mud and dirt. Typically, she'll be a little more finicky. And she'll want to get the little, you know, dolls and she'll do that kind of stuff. And the little boy, he's wanting to take little, little toys and break them and bust them and beat them up and shoot them and do all that kind of stuff. Typically. And, of course, I know we have an effeminization going on of our culture, so things are all out of whack there. But the idea, when you think about the husband and the wife being different, it's not that one's better than the other. It's that God has set an order for there to be order in the family, and there has to be a leader. There has to be a head. Anything with two heads is a freak. Well, we have 50-50. Okay. You're going to have problems because you're going to have two authorities saying, my way, no, my way, no, my way, no. Who's going to be the final decision maker, especially when it regards spiritual things? We're all under authorities. And God set up human government after the time of Noah. And he set up capital punishment. He set up, set up different laws globally, worldwide, for men to be under authority. And frankly, we don't like it. And we are Americans and we have that free spirit and we don't like it. I don't like being told how fast to drive. I don't sure don't like being told to put a seatbelt on. That's my truck. Now, used to up until a few years back, if you had a truck, you didn't have to have a seatbelt on, right? Because it was like a farming thing, right? I don't know if it's still in effect or not. Um, but what are you going to do? This idea of authority, it goes against the grain. As a Christian, you know what the Lord tells you? You're bought with a price. You don't even belong to yourself anymore. Now, you belong to Jesus Christ and He is that authority over you. And the authorities, humanly speaking, He's put in your life, kids, children, you are to be respectful to them. They are the authorities. I never would have thought of even back-talking a police officer when I was a kid growing up. Never would have even come into my mind that you would run from an officer or even talk to they were someone or a school teacher or something like that. No, because you would get in trouble. Now, whatever authority it is, the parent's going to go against it. Whatever authority it is, the kids are going to go against it. We're in anarchy. Respect, don't rebel. Maybe some of the children will be more respectful to the authority as their their mom and dads if moms and dads were more respectful to the authorities in their lives. Nobody wants to follow the rules anymore. Well, I can take it back because I bought it at Walmart. You used it for 30 days! And those kids are seeing that stuff. They're watching it and I'm telling you they're soaking it in. Respect, don't rebel. The Bible says there's a generation, Proverbs 30, that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. You know, even Jesus in Luke chapter number 2, the Bible says he came down to Nazareth and he was, uh, 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 well, it says something. He was subject unto them. See that word subject? To be underneath, submissive. He was subject. He was respectful. Respect, don't rebel. Honor, don't shame. It says, honor thy father and thy mother. We are to bring honor, and we are to honor them and honor the position. You say, well, my dad messed up, my mom did this, and they're, they're not perfect. If different political figures came in, if the governor came in, or president, or, or different people, you say, what would you do? You would honor the office. You should honor the office. There might be a bad man behind the badge. You honor the office. The badge represents every single one of us. People don't realize that. It represents a power and authority greater than just the person behind the title. You have a mother and a father. You honor them simply for, for the fact of them being your mother and your father. Are they always right? Are they perfect? Have they made mistakes? Of course. But there's honor that should be brought. There were some kids, and they're playing in the backyard, as kids often do. And one of the little kids says, my dad's better than your dad. I bet my dad can beat up your dad. You know how that thing goes, you know. My dad can beat up your dad thing. And one little kid said, well, my dad's better than your dad. My dad knows the mayor. Little kid said, that ain't nothing. My dad had lunch with the governor. 
One little kid over there, he was hearing what was going on. He said, man, y'all don't know nothing. He goes, my dad knows God. <laughs> now, that's a good testimony. Here's the thing for you dads in here. Your kids, they need to know that you know God. Do they hear you talking to God? Honor your parents. General Douglas MacArthur made the statement, I don't want to be remembered as the great general who led the armies and liberated the people. I want to be remembered as the Christian father who prayed and read the Bible with his children. Respect, don't rebel. Honor, don't shame. Follow him. Don't run from him. God has given you those parents for a reason. He's given you a father as an example for a reason to learn from, to follow in. The story's told of a uh, father and his son. They're walking back from the trails out, uh, laying some traps and stuff during the snow season. And they're coming through, and they're walking through there. And his son kind of got behind him, and he's looking back kind of frustrated. And the little boy's like, look, Dad, I'm, I'm walking in your steps. And he was walking in every print that his father made. He would make sure he stepped in that very same print. Look, Dad, I'm walking in your steps. It's amazing how much little kids pick up from their moms and dads. They're watching. And they're following. Follow, don't run from them. Now let's talk to the fathers here. Biblical counsel for you fathers. Deuteronomy gives a lot of counsel to this. He talks about taking heed with the word and teaching them to thy sons, to thy sons' sons. He even makes a statement in Deuteronomy chapter 11, Thou shalt write them upon the door of thy house and upon thy gates. In other words, he says you need to talk to your children about what happened. You need to remind them. You need to talk to them. You know, it doesn't take long. Can you believe there are people now, and you can, you can YouTube it <laughs> or Google it, there are people that actually teach the Holocaust did not happen. Do you know there are people that believe that? People that can, they walk around can actually eat and talk and drink and drive a car. That believe that. Doesn't take very long for things to disappear. And so what he told them, especially back in the age before print and all those types of things, they only had copies of what the Levites would write out in the Bible and so forth. He told those fathers, he said, you need to tell your kids what you saw. You need to tell them what God did with the crossing of the Red Sea. You need to tell them how he brought you out of the Passover and all these miracles that you saw and how he brought you through the wilderness journeys and brought you into the land of promise. You need to pass it on to your kids. And he gives them exhortation to remind them. Psalm 78, verse number 4, We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength. Train up a child the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Here's my three things for you, and we're done. Nurture, don't neglect. Nurture, don't neglect. It's said over there in Ephesians, Fathers, bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, obviously, mothers have their touch and they have their way and they have their roles, but a father has his role as well. He is to nurture. I think the idea that John is preaching to fathers, turning their hearts to the children, and then he's the children to the fathers, like I said, why would he say like he's joining them, like he's reconciling? If there's not some recklessness, it's a sad tragedy to see a father that doesn't have time for his kids. They're just too busy. And they're neglecting, and oftentimes it's subconscious. They're not waking up thinking, you know, I'm going to neglect my kid today. You know, I'm going to just... Oftentimes they're actually trying to make money to put food on the table and make money to pay for the soccer and pay for the ball and pay for the games and pay for the whatever for their kid. They're doing it for their kids in a roundabout way and as far as they know, they think they're doing a great job and they just can't see it. And it don't help when maybe, if I can say this, if the mother's just giving them a hard time about it, that ain't going to help things. God's going to have to open their eyes. But oftentimes there's a neglect, and it may not always be conscious. But the admonition this morning as we look at the text,
Eric says, hey, fathers, you don't need to be reckless here. And there's repentance involved. John is preaching repentance, and he's trying to bring a nation to the Messiah. He begins with the families and homes. He begins with the fathers. Look, don't neglect your kids. And I'm sure you would all answer in the affirmative, did God give you those kids? You'd say, yes, okay. Then you are entrusted with a responsibility. Don't neglect them. Nurture them instead. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There was a man that was back in the day before the cars, the horse and buggy days. He was coming into town. He came into town and he jumped off real quick and was get, getting ready to get his horses tied up. You know how you see on all the Western movies? <laughs> they throw a little thing. I'm thinking, man, they ain't tying them horses. Anyway, he's about to get his horses tied up, and uh, the, uh, the, the wagon takes off. And the team of horses just, somebody had done something in the street, startled the horses. They took off, and so he's chasing, trying to get them. And, of course, they're getting faster and faster, and he's trying to go. He jumps. He grabs a hold of the reins. They start dragging him. He gets caught up. He's being dragged. People are just on the side of the street saying, let go, you idiot. Let go, let go. It's not worth it. Let go. He's drug all the way through the street, and finally the thing stops. And people are like, you about killed yourself. I mean, he's all bruised, beat up, bleeding. Then he gets up and makes his way to the back of the wagon, and there's a little boy in the back of the wagon. They didn't know his little boy was back there. Nobody said after that it wasn't worth it. It was worth it. You nurture. You don't neglect. Number two, encourage, don't incite. I like how this text reads in Ephesians. Verse number four, it says, You fathers provoke not your children to wrath. And then in Colossians, he says, For Fathers provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Now look, I know this applies a lot of times to preaching too because as preachers, we are to point out what's wrong. I mean, you got to. If a preacher ain't going to tell you what's wrong, why are you going? It's like, I'm going to go to the doctor. Doctor, make me feel good. Make me feel good. Doctor, just tell me that everything's good. Tell me that everybody loves everybody. Tell me that everybody's okay. No, you want a doctor to tell you the truth. You don't just need somebody to make you feel good. You need somebody to point out, hey, this is where you might consider getting some correction. You might realize you don't need to be eating all those Twinkies. Your blood sugar is going out the roof. Alright, so preaching sometimes is like this, so we have that tendency to always be rebuke, 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 rebuke. And I get that. We need that. You need the devil preached out of you, and I need it preached out of me as well. However, you do need some encouraging. I'm glad that you came to church. That's a blessing. I can give yourself a pat on the back. You could have stayed home, so I'm just going to watch the video. And eat my Doritos and sit in my pajamas and watch the video. I'm glad you came. Uh, if some encouragement is good for time to time because after a while, the negativity sometimes is just, I'm always getting beat up. I'm always, it's kind of like the coaches, you know, they're always on them and always on them. If they don't encourage them from time to time, if they don't maybe take them out and get them an ice cream after they win the game or do something from time to time, it, it breaks the spirit. I think you get the idea. An old preacher said this. He said, let us foster and encourage the good rather than the trouble about the error. He says, we are too anxious to root up the weeds. A vigorous growth in the corn will do much to weaken the growth of the weeds. You're always trying to dig up the weeds and you oh, can't get any weeds. The next thing you know, potato rakes are the best thing to use, by the way, if you have gardens. You're up there, you're digging around. Next thing you know, you went too far, you dug up the plant. Always trying to weed, always trying to weed. Well, just put some water on it. Put some fertilizer on it. Give it some good sunshine. And to some encouragement. And say, you did a great job. You didn't do it as good as I would have done it, but you did a great job. <laughs> a little encouragement might go a long way. It's amazing that he points this out because I think the tendency can be to always, you're having to do that. And by the way, I think it's a very noble thing that you parents are spending the time and taking the time to train your children. 
I can just look and see. It's a full-time job. You're always having to watch, always having to, I mean, when do you get to take a break? <laughs> it's like 24-7. And so you're to be commended with that, but the danger of that is you're always having to get on, always having to get on, always. You better make sure you take some time to encourage. A little girl one time, she was asked what her name was. She said, Jamie Don't. She said, what's your name? She said, Jamie Don't. <laughs> Jamie Don't. You see, she had heard her name, Jamie Don't, so many times, she thought her name was Jamie Don't. Now, sometimes we need some Jamie Do's, right? <laughs> some encouragement. Nurture, don't neglect. Encourage, don't incite. Mentor, don't manage. Mentor, don't manage. I preached this on Mother's Day a little bit along these lines. Motherhood manipulation is what I preached. Of course, it was easier because I didn't have any people in here when I preached that. You can preach really hard when there's nobody looking back at you. But the idea with motherhood manipulation had to do with the fact that a mother always is controlling her children. And she has that instinct to always be managing and controlling. And we have that instinct as well, oftentimes in the workplace. And some of you have to have people that you're over. You have things that you have to always be on top of. And if you're not careful, that mentality can take off with you. And then you don't leave room for them to grow and you don't leave room for God to do something. And so let's be a mentor. If you're going to be a mentor, there's going to be times when you take the training wheels off and you're going to let them fall. And you can't control it. I heard somebody this week on the radio, somebody said, some preacher or somebody said something that I thought was true. They said, a parent is never, a parent is only as happy as its unhappiest child. And that's probably true. And you think about always having to control, always looking, always managing. Well, we need to set an example and back up and say, okay, Lord, what can you do with this? Where's your heart? I'll give you this illustration and be done. This little boy had this terrible dream. Woke up screaming, sweating the whole nine yards, hollering. His daddy came running in there. Little boy, under 10 years old. He's like, Daddy, 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 I had an awful dream. He's like, what's wrong, son? What in the world? And he said, I dreamed you came in here and got on top of me and started choking me to death. And I was hollering and screaming and hollering and screaming and you wouldn't stop and you were killing me. And he says, son, what in the world made you dream that? I would never do that because I know it because I don't know why I dreamed that, you know. And uh, so anyway, he assured his son he wasn't going to kill him and all that kind of stuff. Just a crazy, you know, weird thing. And uh, he, put, he got his son calmed down, and he finally fell back off asleep, and the dad went back into the room, and then the, the, the Lord smote the dad's heart. He wasn't living right, and he was like, your boy's watching you, and you are killing him. We don't realize what effect we have on other people. And fathers should realize the effect they have on their children. I would testify and say that without my father in my life doing the things that he did, I don't know where I would be. I'm so glad that God gave me a good, godly father. He'll be gone five years this year. But you talk about a blessing. And to me, he was the best father ever. You say, I got a good dad. Well, maybe so, but not good as mine. <laughs> but see, he was the father that he gave me. Some of the best times I ever had with my father were when we prayed together. Best times ever. Being able to hear him pray. And when he prayed, I knew he was talking to God. That had an impact on me. More than any preacher... I had some great preachers had an impact on me, you know, definitely, for sure. But he had more of an impact than anybody. And so I want to encourage you fathers and children. You have responsibilities. And the Lord will give you grace. He's given us instruction. The thing to do is to take John's ministry at heart. John was rooting up and he was pulling down and he was preparing that ground for repentance and reconciliation. And here's the thing, if you're willing in your heart to say, you know what, 
I might have made some mistakes in the past. I might not have treated my parents right or I might not have been the father that I needed to be. But I'm going to turn from that and I'm going to start doing what I'm supposed to do by God's grace. I believe God can give reconciliation where he turns the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children's hearts to the fathers. You know, we've all sinned. We've all messed up. But God's amazing grace can give you strength to reconcile and to make it right and to love your father and love your children like you're supposed to. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the scriptures, the insight that you give us. Lord, thank you for this manual, this book that tells us about something very practical, just daily life in the home. God, I pray for our fathers that you may bless them, that you might strengthen them. Lord, they're trying to serve you and do what's right. God, I pray that you give them the strength, give them the courage, give them the discernment in the areas that they need the discernment. And Father, I pray that you'd help the young people and the kids to understand the authority in their life and how they have to honor that authority and realize that rebellion against the authority that you've placed in their life is rebellion against you. And God, I pray that we may see that. Lord, I pray in the end that the reconciliation of the families would bring reconciliation with all of us to you, Lord, that we might be better Christians, better believers as a result. Lord, thank you for good fathers. I'm so thankful for my father that you put in my life. And just what a blessing, Lord, you've been to me. Thank you for being our Heavenly Father. David said, though my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. And some of our fathers have passed on. And we still have a Heavenly Father that leads us and guides us. I pray, God, that you might go with us. I pray that you might bless us, bless the fathers, give them a good day today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you for coming.